Chapter One of the Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun by Catul Mendez, translated by Thomas John Rivian, eighteen fifty-five to nineteen twenty-five. A word of introduction who has visited the pale islands where it snows jasmine flowers or has wandered through the forest of brocaliande where the fairy oriana once upon a time bridged the dewdrops with oaten straws to save the caterpillars from wetting their velvet feet who knows the boundaries of the kingdom of ormuz can tell the sea in which glistens the golden isle the name of the last emperor of trebizond or describe the lost glories of matakin who has heard of the silver-winged Urgande, Urgale, or Melusine, of their pale sister Habondi, or of the wicked outcast Melandrine? There may be some travellers along the byways of fancy who have landed on these elusive shores, and doubtless there are students of the recondite who have made the acquaintance of these shadowy monarchs and flitting elves, but to the great bulk of readers, even to those of fairy stories, all this is new country with stranger people for this reason if for none other this version of les contes du rouet of catul mendes should be made welcome but there are other reasons why the stories may claim a place among the treasured records of fairydom for their delicate play of imagination for their jauntiness their sudden turns of situation their unexpected twists of praise and for their general sweetness and lovability then too fairy stories as they are in that they deal with the airy creatures of times and places that never were and never could be they have often a deeper significance than appears on their surface and behind their quips and wonders there lies a lesson quaint severe or pathetic as was the mood of the story spinner as he wrote for all of these reasons and for many that are untold the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun is set out in its english dress with some misgiving that much of the first-hand delicacy may have been lost in the process of a change of language but with none as to the charm of the original thomas j vivian new york october eighteen ninety eight end of introduction chapter one of the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emma Baker The Fairy's Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun by Catul Mendes Translated by Thomas John Drew Vivian 1855 to 1925 The Sleeping Beauty Serious history is not the only thing that has been written in a slipshod fashion. There has been a good deal of blundering in fairy tales as well. And even the most careful and best informed storytellers have not always set down things exactly as they happened. For instance, although we have believed up to this time that the eldest of Cinderella's wicked sisters went to the prince's ball in a dress of red velvet, draped with English lace. The fact is that she wore a scarlet robe, embroidered with silver passementery and golden cords. So, too, while it is true that, of all the monarchs invited to the wedding of the white cat, some did come in sedan chairs, others in coaches, and others from distant countries, mounted upon elephants, tigers, and eagles. While all this is true, the other fact has not been stated, that the king of Mataquin made his entry into the court of the palace seated between the wings of a great dragon, from whose nostrils there came flames of jewels. You may perhaps be curious to find out how I come to know so much upon these very important points. And I will tell you. Some time ago I used to visit a hut which stood beside a field, where there lived a very old woman, old enough to be a fairy, 
and indeed I always suspected her of being one. After I had once or twice kept her company while she warmed herself in the sunshine before her little cottage, she took a liking to me, and a few days before she died, or returned to her mysterious country, I don't know which, she offered me a keepsake, an old spinning wheel. It was an extraordinary spinning wheel, for every time I turned the wheel it began to talk or rather to sing, using a sweet little shaky voice, something like that of a grandmother who during the day had prattled more than she should. What it said or sang was a number of pretty stories. Some of these no one else knew of, and others it knew better than any one else. And in the latter case, it took a sort of mischievous pleasure in pointing out and correcting the mistakes made by those who had busied themselves in writing these stories. You see, then, that I had a teacher of a very remarkable sort. And let me say, while I think of it, you would be wonderfully astonished if I were to tell you of all the things and changes and additions that the wheel had revealed to me. You imagine, I have no doubt, that you know each detail of the story of the princess who, having pricked her hand with a spindle, fell into a sleep so sound that nothing could rouse her, and who was laid in the castle in the middle of a wood upon a bed of gold and silver embroidery. Well, now, I am sorry to tell you that you do not know the true ending of the story at all. Yes, yes, purred the wheel. It is true enough that the princess slept for a hundred years. When a young prince, moved by love and glory, resolved to penetrate the wood and awaken her, the great trees, the thorns and the brambles opened of themselves to let him pass. He walked toward the castle, which he saw at the end of a long avenue, and soon entered it. What surprised him not a little was to find that not one of his retinue had been able to follow him, the trees crowding themselves together again as soon as he had passed. At last, when he had crossed several courts paved with marble, passing on his way a number of red-nosed lackeys who slept beside their cups, in which were still some drops of wine, when he had rambled down endless passages, and mounted great staircases on which were guards snoring, with carbines on their shoulders. After passing all these things and persons, he found himself in a golden chamber, and saw upon a bed, whose curtains were open on all sides, the most beautiful sight that had ever met his eyes. It was a princess who seemed to be about sixteen or seventeen years of age, and whose beauty was beyond words. I am willing to admit, said the wheel, that these things happened just so, and that up to this point the storytellers have not strayed away from the truth. But nothing can be more misleading than the rest of the story, and I must contradict the statement that the sleeping beauty, when awakened, looked lovingly at the prince, and that she said, Is that you, my lord? You have been long waited for. If you want to know what really did happen, listen. The princess stretched one white arm, then the other, half opened her eyes, shut them again, as though troubled by the light, yawned a little, while Puff, her lapdog, awakened also, snapped and bristled with anger. Who is there? the daughter of the fairies asked at length, and what is wanted? The prince fell upon his knees and replied, He who is here adores you, and has braved the greatest perils. He was something of a boaster, you see. To relieve you from the enchantment in which you have so long been held captive. Leave this bed on which you have been sleeping for a hundred years. Give me your hand, and let us return together to light and life. Astonished at these words, she looked attentively at him, and could not keep back a smile. 
for he was a young and shapely prince, with the loveliest eyes in the world, and he spoke in a very sweet and pleasant manner. It is really true, then, she asked, putting back her hair, that the hour has come in which I am to be delivered from my long sleep. It is, answered the prince. Ah, said she. She thought a while and then said, What will happen to me if I leave this shadow land and go back to life? Can you not guess? asked the prince. Have you forgotten that you are the daughter of a king? You will see your people running to meet you, crying out for joy and waving banners of every colour. Women and children will kiss the hem of your robe. In a word, you will be the most powerful and petted of all the queens of the East. It would please me to be a queen, she said. What else would happen? You would live in a palace that glistened like gold, replied the prince. And in mounting the steps of your throne, you would walk upon inlaid patterns of precious stones. Courtiers grouped about would sing your praises, and the oldest and wisest heads would be bowed before the power and grace of your smile. To be praised and obeyed is charming, said she. Would I have any other pleasure? Waiting maids, clever as fairies, would clothe you in dresses of the tints of the sun and moon. You would powder your hair with diamond dust, and you would have a mantle of golden cloth trailing yards behind you. That would be charming, said she. I always did like fine clothes. Pages as lovely as hummingbirds would offer you the finest candies in beautiful comfort boxes, and would pour perfumed wine into your cup. That pleases me, said she. I always had a sweet tooth. Would these be all my joys? Another pleasure, the greatest of all, yet awaits you, said the prince. What is it? You will be beloved, he replied. By whom? By me, that is, if you do not think me unworthy to aspire to your affection. Well, said she, you are a prince of good appearance, and your clothes fit you well. If, continued the prince, you deign not to send me away, I will give you my whole heart, as another kingdom of which you will be the sovereign, and I will never cease to be the obedient slave of your most willful caprices. Oh, what happiness you promise me, exclaimed the princess. Rise then, dearest, and follow me. Follow you already? Wait a moment, said the princess. I must think a little. You have certainly held out more than one tempting promise. But as you see, I must be sure first that I am not leaving what is better behind me. What do you mean, princess? exclaimed the prince. I have slept for a hundred years, it is true. But it is also true that for a hundred years I have been dreaming. I am a queen in my dreams, and of what a lovely, lovely kingdom. My dream palace has walls of light. For courtiers, I have angels who treat me to music of delightful sweetness. When I walk, it is upon pathways strewn with stars. Then, if you could only know of the beautiful dream robes that I wear, and of the delicious fruits that are set on my table, and of the honeyed wines in which I dip my lips, and as to love, Believe me, I am not without it, for in my dreams I am adored by a lover more handsome than any of the princes of the earth, one who has been faithful to me for a hundred years. All things considered, my lord, I do not think I should gain anything by coming out of my enchantment. I pray you, sir, wish me good day, and let me go to sleep again. Whereupon she turned her pretty face toward the wall, spread her hair over her eyes, and once more renewed her long sleep, while Puff stopped yelping, crooked in his legs, and laid his muzzle on his paws. The prince withdrew in high displeasure, and since that time, thanks to the protection of the good fairies, 
no one has troubled the rest of the sleeping beauty in the woods end of the sleeping beauty chapter three of the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david derrida the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun by catul mendez translated by thomas jeanry vivian from 1855 1925 chapter three The Three Sowers Three young companions set out to see the world. As the season was winter, it rained and blew and snowed all over the surrounding country. But the road along which the three passed was golden with sunshine. While each time the hawthorn bloom swayed in a gentle breeze, a swarm of butterflies and bees rose from it into the air. This was because the three companions were youths of sixteen, and it being springtime in their hearts it was springtime all about them in the same way if an old man goes into a garden on a rosy morning of may the daylight seems to fade out the sky grows cloudy and the white honeysuckles look like so many snowflakes so these three walked along just following the road and that after all is the best way to walk one of these youths was named honrat the other was called chrysor while the third and youngest was called Alloys. They were all three handsome, with the freshness of health upon their cheeks, and with curly hair blown here and there by the wind. Seeing them thus walking along that sunny road, you would scarcely have noticed any difference between them, but a close examination would have shown that Honrad had the proudest air, that Chrysler was quiet and shrewd, and that Alloys was the most gentle and timid. What they seemed to be on the outside, they were within, for the body is but the casing of the soul. Only men have had the bad habit of wearing this envelope the wrong side out. Honorat, in his fancies, pictured himself as the son of some most powerful king. Poor, hungry child of fortune, eating the crusts thrown to him from the windows of the rich, drinking water from the springs of the hollow of his hand, and sleeping in the shelter of barns, he yet dreamed of being surrounded by power and glory. He dreamed, too, of courtiers, gorgeous with lace, kneeling before him in a throne room supported on pillars of jasper and marble, while through wild folding doors ambassadors entered, hastening from foreign lands, behind them coming African slaves, clad in red satin, and bearing chests in which were marvelous and charming jewels, fine pearls, silks, and brocade, the humble offerings of the Emperor Trebizonde and the King of Cyrenagon. Or else he imagined that he was leading an innumerable army to victory, putting the troops of the enemy to flight with his flashing sword, and then that his loving people bore him in triumph underneath arches decorated with flapping banners over which glory spread her wings. Chrysler dreamed of things less heroic. His thoughts ran to money, great sums of money, always money, to gold and silver, especially to gold, to diamonds without count, any one of which would be worth all the treasures of the richest monarchs. The gold of his visions was forever sparkling before his eyes and flowing between his fingers, even when he held out his hands to passers-by, and was thankful for a copper cent. So great was his love for gold, indeed, that had he been placed between two doors, one leading to paradise and the other to a treasure chamber, I do not believe he would have opened that which led to paradise. As to little alloys, better looking and more delicate than his companions, he troubled himself nothing about palaces, courtiers, ambassadors, or armies. In place of a table laden with a service of gold, he would have preferred a corner in a flowery meadow. With his youthful appearance, an appearance, in fact, almost like that of a young girl than like that of a lad, he kept his eyes fixed on the ground, watching the lady birds climbing up on the blades of grass, and raising them only to admire the rosy dawn on the crimson sunset. The only pleasure he desired and he really enjoyed it, was to sing as he walked, to sing in the morning the song he had composed on the evening before, a song of pretty shyness, 
set to a pleasant tune, which the birds of the bushes took up and sang back as a chorus. So it happened that, if in the night time, in the clear silence of the stars, they heard one of those strange noises which are but the sighs of nature in her sleep, if one of those noises were heard, Listen, Honorat would say, is that not the sound of a trumpet? Chrysler, on the other hand, would ask, is that not the distant sound of a piece of gold rolling into a drawer? While Alloys would murmur, I fancy it must be the chirping of some little birds in their nests chirping before they go to sleep again. One day an old woman, who was digging out a narrow furrow in a barren field, saw these three young youths coming along the road. She was so old and so ragged that you might have taken her for long ago in tatters, and she was as ugly as she was old. One yellow eye was gone, and the other half was covered with a film. Three tufts of gray hair stuck out from the folds of a dirty old cotton handkerchief wound round her head. Her skin was red and wrinkled, and her lips went flip-flap over her toothless gums every time she breathed. Anyone who met her would have hurried away, anxious to see a rose or a pretty child to make him forget her ugliness. She was, however, only a fairy in disguise, and no sooner did she see the three young companions, Honorat, Chrysler, and Alloys, than she transformed herself into a lovely sylph clad in gorgeous robes, the skirts of which were so embroidered in flowers and precious stones that butterflies came floating about her, thinking that the whole of April was stopping in this barren field. "'What ho, my pretty youths,' said the fairy. "'Stop, I pray you. I wish to do you a favor. First, because you are young, which is a charming thing in itself, and next, because I have noticed that you always take care when walking, not to crush the poor little insects as they cross the lane. Come here, and sow whatever seed you have in this furrow which I have just dug out. Do this, and, on my honor as a fairy, this field, barren though it seems to be, will give you back a hundredfold all of that you've put into it. I leave you to think how charmed the three travelers were to see so sweet a creature and to hear her speak such pleasant words. At the same time, they found themselves very much embarrassed, being so poor that they had not the faintest thing in the world to put into the fairy furrow. Alas, madame, said Honorat, after having talked a moment with Chrysler and Alan, we have nothing which we would wish to see return a hundredfold, unless it be our dreams, and they will never bear fruit. "'How do you know that?' asked the fairy, shaking out her hair to drive away a butterfly, which was very naturally mistaking her for a bed of pinks. "'How do you know that?' she repeated. "'Sow your dreams into the open ground, and we will see what will come up.' Then Honorat knelt down, and putting his mouth to the furrow, began to whisper into it all of his ambitious fancies. He told the furrow about the place of jasper and marble crowded with courtiers in fine laces, of ambassadors entering by the royal doors, of negroes borne down beneath the burden of tributes, and of armies in triumphs. He had not time to finish all of his story when troops of horsemen in golden breastplates and with eagles' wings for crests came galloping over the plain, proclaiming it aloud that they sought for the son of the dead monarch to conduct him into his kingdom. As soon as they saw Honorath, they cried, It is he! and carried him off as their master, with sounds of joy to his marble palaces, to his battles, and his spoils. Having seen this, Chrysler did not long delay to kneel down and sow into the soil his dream wishes for riches, for money, for jewels. Scarcely had he spoken twenty words before the furrow was filled with gold and silver, with diamonds and pearls. Drunk with joy, he leaped upon these treasures, grasped them in his hands, filled his pockets and even his mouth with them, and went off, the richest of the rich, seeking for some hiding place in which to conceal his treasures. "'Well, Alloys,' said the fairy, "'what are you thinking about? Why do you not follow the example of your companions?' He did not reply at first, having scarcely taken any notice of what had passed his attention having been given to a myrtle bush round which a wild clematis was lovingly twining itself. "'Why should I?' he replied at length. "'There is nothing I wish for except to listen to the nightingale sing in the evening and to hear the crickets chirping in the hot noonday. 
all that I could do would be to sing a song into the furrow. Well, sing it, replied the fairy. Perhaps the seed of a song is worth more than anything else. So Alois sang his song into the furrow, and as he began his second verse, a beautiful maiden came out of the opening earth, and linking her arms in his, said, Ah, how sweetly you sing! Let me be your friend and new companion. Thus did the good fairy come to the aid of three wandering buttes who had been walking along the sunlit road, heedless of where they went. But when a little time had passed, there came about such results to two of the youths as were sad indeed. Beaten by an obstinate enemy after doing wonders of courage, King Honorat was obliged to quit his capital and to take refuge in a monastery, where they cut off his hair after having first taken away his crown. A band of robbers discovered the hiding place where Chrysler the Rich had stowed away his treasures, stole it, and left him to beg for alms on the highways. Alois alone was happy, for the maiden who loved his songs soon loved him also and married him so that she might be with him always. End of chapter 3 Recording by David Derrida Chapter 4 of The Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emma Charlotte The Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun by Catul Mendes Translated by Thomas Jondry Vivian 1855 to 1925. The Princess Birdie. Though she was so small that she might easily have been taken for the elder sister of her doll, the daughter of the King of the Golden Isle was the prettiest princess you ever saw. When she arrived at young womanhood, her father asked her if she had any objections to being married. Oh, none at all, she replied. In that case, said her father. I shall give a grand feast, and invite to it all the young princes of the neighbouring countries, from whom you may make a choice that will be worthy of yourself and me. Do not take so much trouble, father, said the princess. It would simply be putting you to a great deal of unnecessary expense. For a long time I have had a sweetheart. And there is nothing more that I could wish for than that you should give me for a husband the nightingale who warbles every evening in the rose bush that climbs about my window. The king, as you may well imagine, had all he could do to remain as serious as a king should always be. What? cried he. You wish to marry a bird, do you? to present me with a feathered son-in-law and live in a cage? A charming idea, I must say. These mocking speeches hurt the princess so cruelly that she retired to her room with a bursting heart. In the evening she leaned out of her window, while the nightingale sang in the hawthorn. Ah, beautiful bird, she cried. This is not the time to be happy, for my father will not consent to our marriage. But to this the nightingale replied, Do not sorrow, dear princess. Everything will be well, because we love each other. And he consoled her by singing all the sweetest songs that he knew. About this time three giants who were also very famous magicians, laid siege to the capital of the kingdom of the Golden Isle. They had no need of any army, so strong and cruel were they. They marched up to the city walls and announced, in voices like so many tempests, that if in three days the city were not delivered over to them, they would destroy it to the very foundations and kill all the inhabitants. 
the terror caused by this announcement was so great that all the mothers ran about the streets pressing their weeping children in their arms while many of the courtiers talked of submitting to the free magicians without striking a blow as a means of saving himself in this terrible peril the king sent couriers to all the neighbouring princes announcing that he would give his daughter in marriage to whomsoever would deliver him from these giants but the princes notwithstanding the promised recompense kept away believing the combat to be too unequal on hearing this all the people looked forward to perishing in the ruins of the city when it happened that just before the evening of the third day two soldiers who were watching on the walls saw the three giants dash out of the tent where they had been taking an afternoon's nap and dart off howling like mad folks the general joy was now as great as the general despair had been yet no one could guess the cause of so unforeseen a deliverance father said the princess to the king it is the bird i love to whom you must render thanks for this happy event he flew into the tent of the giants while they slept and pecked their eyes out with his beak you will of course keep your promise and let me marry the nightingale who sings in the climbing rose tree but the king begged his daughter not to trouble him with such foolish fancies and turned his back upon her in a very angry humour that evening when the nightingale sang among the flowers and leaves ah beautiful bird whom i love said the princess this is not the time to rejoice for although you have delivered us from the giants my father will not consent to our marriage the nightingale replied do not trouble yourself dear princess all will yet be well because we love each other and he consoled her by singing new songs which he had just composed some time after this the treasurer of the palace disappeared without any one being able to imagine what had become of him and at the same time the great coffer of cedar and gold was found empty without so much as a ruby diamond or pearl left in any of its corners the king who was a very greedy man showed himself extremely put out about this loss and went around bemoaning it like a beggar that had been robbed of his pennies at last he sent out heralds to all the neighbouring kingdoms announcing that he would give his daughter in marriage to the man prince or no prince who should find out where the robber was and bring back the jewels all this went for nothing however and many days passed without any news of the treasurer or treasure but one morning when the king gloomily opened the coffer he uttered a cry of joy for there were all the pearls the rubies and the diamonds back again you would have said that the room were full of stars so great was the brilliancy of the precious stones you can easily picture the satisfaction of the king and he immediately set about finding out who had brought back the jewels father said the princess it is the bird i love to whom you must give thanks for this happy recovery he had watched and followed the robber and knew where the treasure was hidden during many days and during many nights with great trouble carrying a ruby in his left claw a pearl in his right and a diamond in his beak he has flown from the hidden treasure to the coffer I held the window open for him while you slept or while you were hunting. You surely now will keep your promise and let me marry the nightingale. 
that the king was as obstinate as he was greedy he grew angry and threatened to lock her in a tower if she ever spoke to him again of marriage with such a husband that evening while the nightingale sang in the moonlight ah beautiful bird whom i love said the princess this is not the time to rejoice for though you have restored my father's treasure he will not consent to our marriage the nightingale replied do not trouble yourself princess for all will yet be well with us since we love each other and he consoled her by singing the most charming song she had ever heard notwithstanding the nightingale's songs the princess languished and died of a broken heart to carry her to the royal tomb she was laid upon a mass of white carnations and roses where she lay whiter even than the flowers she was followed by a crowd in tears the king marching beside the perfumed bier uttering cries of grief that would have moved a heart of marble when they had arrived at the cemetery and were about to lay the body in the tiny grave a nightingale fluttered by and perching himself upon the branch of a yew tree said king what will you do for him who shall give you back the princess alive i will give him the princess herself cried the king i and with half of my kingdom keep your kingdom replied the nightingale your daughter is all i want but beware lest you break your oath at these words the nightingale flew down from the tree and perching himself upon the chin of the dead placed a blade of grass between her lips with his beak immediately the princess sat up alive and well oh father said she surely now you will keep your promise and permit me to marry the nightingale alas the king forgot his oath and no sooner did he hold his living daughter in his arms once more than he ordered his courtiers to chase away the impertinent bird then there came to pass a wonderful thing the little daughter of the king began to grow smaller and smaller like a flake of snow mounting in the sunshine until she was a tiny winged creature no bigger than a baby's fist the loveliest of princesses had become the loveliest of birds and while her father too late repented of his ingratitude and howled out his arms in despair she flew away with the nightingale to the neighbouring woods. End of The Princess Birdie Chapter 5 of The Fairy's Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Emma Charlotte the Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun by Catula Mendes Translated by Thomas John Tree Vivian 1855 to 1925 Chapter 5 There was once another kingdom in which no mirror could be found. All looking-glasses, those to be hung upon the wall, those to be held in the hand, and those that had been formerly carried at the girdle, all had been broken to atoms by the order of the queen the discovery of the smallest looking-glass or the smallest piece of a looking-glass in any house meant the punishment of those who owned it with the most fearful pains the reason for this most extraordinary state of affairs was as follows ugly so ugly that the most hideous monsters seemed charming beside her the queen not only wished never to see herself 
but was also determined that no one else should have the chance of finding out how pretty his or her face was when compared with that of her own. You may easily believe that these laws by no means satisfied the girls and young women of that country. Of what use was it to have beautiful eyes, a mouth as fresh as roses, or to put flowers in your hair, if you could not see how all these things looked? You could not even admire yourself in a stream or in a lake for all the rivers and ponds had been covered over with closely fitting slabs of stone. Water was drawn from wells so deep that no one could see their liquid surface, and kept in dark, flat dishes, in which there was no reflection. The people of that kingdom were, in fact, in despair, especially those who were vain, and there were vain persons in that country as well as there are in this. All of this pleased the Queen, who was happy to know that her subjects were as much dissatisfied at not being able to see themselves as she was furious whenever she caught a glimpse of her own hideous face. It happened, however, that in a certain suburb of the royal city there was a young girl called Jacintha, who was less disturbed than many of the others about the looking-glass law, because of a sweetheart whom she had. When someone finds you pretty, and is always telling you so, there is no need of a mirror. Now tell me truly, she would say, the colour of my eyes does not displease you. They are like forget-me-nots, in each of which has fallen a drop of clear amber, her lover would reply. I have not a dark skin. Your forehead is purer than snow, and your cheeks are like pale roses. What do you think of my mouth? she went on. It is like a ripe raspberry. And my teeth, if you please. They are like grains of rice, said the youth. And what about my ears? Have I any cause to be unhappy about them? Yes, he replied, if one need be uneasy about having two little pink shells nestling against her hair. So they talked, she charmed to listen, and he to see and speak. One day he asked her to marry him, and she blushed and consented. Unfortunately, the news of the coming marriage reached the ears of the wicked queen, whose sole pleasure it was to destroy the happiness of others. And Jacintha, being prettier than any one else, was hated all the more for it. Some days before the wedding, Jacintha was walking in her mother's orchard, when an old hag drew near and asked for alms and then started back with a cry, as though she had trodden upon a toad. "'Heaven preserve us!' screamed the old hag. "'What do I see? "'Why do you cry out, and what have you seen, my good woman?' asked Jacintha. "'What do I see?' said the bell dame. "'Why, the ugliest thing on earth! Then you certainly do not mean me, said Jacintha, smiling. Alas, yes, my poor child, I do mean you. I have been long in this world, but never yet have I met with anyone so frightful as you are. I, frightful, exclaimed Jacintha, a hundred times more so than I can describe. What do you mean by saying such things, said the girl, half crying. Look at my eyes. They are mud-coloured, said the hag, but that would not matter so much if you had not such a horrible squint. My skin. From its appearance I should say that you had been rubbing charcoal on your cheeks and forehead. M my mouth, stammered poor Jacintha. It is as Colourless as a faded flower of autumn, said the wretched old woman. My teeth, 
If great yellow fangs are lovely teeth, then I never saw any lovelier than yours. At least my ears, Jacintha began. Your ears are so big, red and hairy, interrupted the crone, that I shudder to look at them. And I know that I am not pretty to look at myself, but I think I should die of shame if I had a mouth like that. Upon this the hag, who was a wicked fairy, and consequently a friend of the wicked queen, trotted off with a burst of mocking laughter, while Jacintha dropped weeping upon a seat underneath the apple trees. Nothing could turn Jacintha from grieving over her affliction. I am ugly, I am ugly, she unceasingly cried. It was in vain that her lover assured her to the contrary. Leave me, she begged. You are not telling me the truth just because you pity me. That poor old woman had no interest in deceiving me. It is true, I am ugly, I know it. To set her right, he brought a number of his friends to her house, every one of whom told Jacintha that it was a pleasure to look upon her. All this, however, was of no use. She insisted that they only said so to soothe her, and that she knew she was a fright. Then the youth asked her to fix the day of their marriage. I become your wife, she cried. Never, I think too tenderly of you to make you a present of such a shocking-looking thing as I am. Driven to his wit's end, the young man saw that the only way to undo the evil which the hag had done was to get a mirror, to show Jacintha the truth. But where could a mirror be found? There was not one in the whole kingdom, and the terror of the queen was such that no workman could be induced to make one. To the court, then, cried the youth. Cruel as our queen is, she cannot fail to be moved by my tears and by Jacintha's beauty. If it is only for a few hours, she will withdraw this cruel law from which all our griefs have come, and let me show Jacintha the true picture of her own lovely face. It was not without much trouble that the girl could be prevailed upon to go to the palace, but at last she consented. "'What is it? What is it?' asked the wicked queen, in her shrill, harsh voice. "'Who are these people, and what do they wish?' Someone tell me and tell me quickly. Your Majesty, replied the youth, you have before you the most unhappy of lovers. Well, I must say that is indeed a good reason for coming to me, sneered the Queen. Do not be pitiless, pleaded the young man. Why, what have I to do with your trouble, snarled the Queen. If you would only permit me to have a mirror, the youth began. At these words the queen rose, trembling with anger. You have dared to speak to me of mirrors, she cried, grinding her teeth. Don't be angry, your majesty, begged the youth. Deign to hear me. This young girl whom you see before you, so fresh and beautiful, has fallen into a most singular error. She imagines that she is ugly. So she is, shouted the queen with a ferocious laugh. For I must say, I don't think I ever saw so odious an object. At these words, Jacintha nearly died with grief. It was not possible now to doubt any longer, since both the queen and the beggar woman had said precisely the same thing. Slowly she closed her eyes, and then fell fainting upon the steps of the throne. Furious with rage at the queen's cruelty, the youth cried out loudly that her majesty was insane, unless she had some reason for lying so. He had no time to add another word before the guards threw themselves upon him and bound him. The queen gave a sign, and the executioner, who was always kept at the side of the throne, advanced towards the youth. Do your duty, screamed the queen, 
pointing to the unfortunate young man who had insulted her. Cut his head off before I count three. The executioner quietly drew his bright sword, when Jacintha feebly beat the air with her hands, and opened her eyes. At that instant two different cries were heard. One a cry of joy, for in the polished naked steel Jacintha saw herself, and saw that she was sweetly pretty. The other a cry of agony, because the wicked queen broke her heart with shame and rage at seeing her foul face reflected in the truthful mirror of the gleaming sword side by side with that of the lovely jacintha end of chapter five recording by emma charlotte chapter six of the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phone the Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun by Catul Mendez, translated by Thomas John Vivian, eighteen fifty five to nineteen twenty five. Snowheart. There was once a kingdom in which lived a princess so lovely that all the world agreed that nobody as perfect as she had ever been seen in it before. Her beauty was altogether thrown away, however, because she would love no one. Notwithstanding the prayers of her parents, she disdainfully refused all suitors who came to ask her hand. When the nephews of kings or the sons of emperors came to the court to propose for her, she did not even condescend to look upon them, no matter how handsome or young they might be. "'What is the use of troubling me about such trifles?' she would say, turning her pretty head away. At last, on account of the coldness which she showed to all persons at all time, the princess was named Snowheart in vain her nurse a good old woman of great experience spoke to her as follows with tears in her eyes take care what you are doing said the dame it is not right to answer those who love us with all their heart with cold and cruel words do you mean to tell me that among all these handsome youths who are so desirous to obtain you in marriage there is not one toward whom you feel some tenderness take care i tell you the good fairies who have granted you your splendid beauty will some day or other grow angry if you continue to show yourself a miser of their gift for what they have given you they wish that you should share with others the more you are worth the more you owe our gifts must be measured by your riches what would you do little one if your protectors angry at your indifference should abandon you to the wickedness of certain fairies who only rejoice in doing evil and who are constantly hovering about young princesses to find a chance to carry out their wicked intentions. But Snowheart took no account of these good counsels. She only shrugged her white shoulders and admired herself in a mirror, an occupation in which she found all the employment she needed. As to the king and queen, they grieved more than any one else over the indifference of their daughter. At last they came to the conclusion that some evil spirit had taken possession of her and they sent out heralds to all the countries of the world, proclaiming that they would give the princess herself to whomsoever should deliver her from the magician of whose power she was the victim. Now it happened about the same time that there lived in a great forest nearby a hideous woodchopper, crooked in every part of him, and who limped when he walked because of the weight of the hump on his back. He was the terror of all the country round, for most of the time he paid but little attention to woodchopping, and hid in a dark ravine, waiting for unwary travellers, springing on them, and then cutting off their heads with his axe at a single stroke. That done, he would empty the pockets of the corpse, and, with the money found there, would buy food and wine, with which he stuffed himself, in his hut, yelling for joy all the time. In fact, this wicked man was far happier at times than many honest persons, that is, so long as travellers passed through the forest but the forest soon grew to have so bad a name that even the bravest people went far out of their way rather than pass through it deprived of his horrible means of living the woodchopper nearly perished for several days he managed to exist on the fragments of his feasts 
gnawing the bones and licking out the few drops left in the bottom of empty bottles as you may imagine this was but poor fare for such a drunkard and glutton as he and then the rigours of winter came and filled up the measure of his discomfort crouched in his hut through which the wind blew and into which the snow fell he almost died of cold and hunger while he dared not seek help from the people of the neighbouring village because of the hate which they bore him you may ask why he did not make a fire with the dried branches and leaves that lay about him he did not because both the wood and leaves were so full of frost that there was no way of lighting them one would suppose indeed that in order to punish this wicked man an unknown power prevented the fuel from taking fire however that might be the woodchopper passed many unhappy days and still more wretched nights near his empty cupboard and cold fireside and to see him thus thin and shivering you would surely have pitied him had you not known how truly he deserved his present misery by his past crimes however there was somebody who took pity on him a wicked fairy called melandrine it was her pleasure to witness evil and so it was but natural that she should love those who did it one night while he was most forlorn and desolate his teeth chattering with cold and his fingers crippled with chilblains melandrine appeared before him coming up out of the ground she was not a beautiful fairy with garlands of flowers in her hair nor did she wear a dress of brocade covered with dazzling embroidery of precious stones she was ugly bald as humpbacked as he and as ragged as a pauper you would surely have taken her for an old beggar woman on the highway for when one is wicked one cannot be pretty even if a fairy don't be cast down my poor man she said i am come to aid you follow me very much astonished at this apparition the woodcutter followed melandrine to a clearing in the wood where he saw great drifts of snow heaped all around now then said she light a fire ah he cried shivering snow will not burn that's just where you are mistaken she cried take this sprig of wild bean which i have brought you and you need only touch any of these snowdrifts to have as jolly a fire as you wish he did as she directed and judge of his astonishment when scarcely had the sprig of wild bean come near the snow than the white flakes leaped into flame as though they had been made of tow while all the clearing was illuminated by the merry light from this moment the woodchopper although he still continued to be hungry no longer suffered from the cold for no sooner did he feel the slightest shiver than he gathered up a heap of snow whether in his hut or on the road touched it with his wand and warmed himself at the strange fireside several days after this adventure there was a great to-do in the capital of the kingdom the court of the king's palace was filled with halberdiers who clanked their pikes upon the pavement and everywhere there was excitement and agitation it was in the throne room however that this bustle was at its height for there the most powerful princes of the earth were gathered to engage in a struggle of courtesy as to who should conquer snowheart first came the nephew of the emperor of trebizond and bent the knee i command more armed men said he than there are leaves in all the forest and in my coffers there are more pearls than there are stars in the sky will you my princess reign over my people and adorn yourself with my pearls what is it he says asked the princess pettishly and that was all the notice she took of him next came the son of the king of matakin and knelt before her young as i am said he i have already conquered the most powerful knights in tourney and with a single stroke of my sword i have cut off the hundred heads of a dragon which devoured all the newborn babes and maidens of my kingdom o oh, princess will you share my glory which with you will grow yet brighter he has spoken so low said the princess yawning that i really don't know what he has talked about then came other princes boasting of their power their riches and their glory following these came poets with tender words sung to a sweet accompaniment upon the guitar knights who had fought in perilous fights to preserve fair women and pages almost as beautiful as the princess herself what do all these people want asked snowheart crossly i wish somebody would ask them to leave 
Their chatter wearies me, and I long to be alone that I may admire myself in the mirror. Ah, little one, little one, said the nurse, be careful you do not irritate the good fairies. At this moment there advanced a miserable lout, hideous in face, crooked in person, and limping beneath the weight of an enormous hump. The courtiers, who were at the foot of the throne, stepped forward to drive him away, but he continued to draw nearer, and with the end of a sprig of wild bean he touched the cold bosom of Snowheart. At the touch the princess instantly started to her feet. "'I love him! I love him!' she cried, as she felt her heart take fire and melt in tenderness. You can easily imagine the excitement that followed, but the king for once kept his word and allowed his daughter to follow the hideous woodchopper to the withered forest. There they lived most unhappily together, for her love did not blind her so much that she could not see how unworthy was the wretched creature who had warmed her heart at last. And this was the punishment of Snowheart. End of chapter 6「Seven of the Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun by Catul Mendez. Translated by Thomas John Vivian, 1855 to 1925. The Fatal Wish with bare feet and with hair floating in the wind a beggar lad passed along the road before the king's palace beggar though he was he was very handsome with golden curls big black eyes and mouth as fresh as a rose after rain the sun seemed to take a particular pleasure in looking at him and there was really more light and brightness round about his rags than lay upon the satins velvets and brocades of the gentlemen and noble ladies lounging in the court of honour oh how lovely she is exclaimed the beggar suddenly stopping he had seen the princess rosalind who was sitting at her window and truly it was impossible to find anything more lovely than she was motionless with his arms raised towards the window as though towards an opening in the sky through which he caught a glimpse of paradise the beggar would have remained thus until evening if a guard had not chased him away with the butt of a halberd and with hard words he went away holding down his head it seemed to him that now everything was gloomy before him and around him the horizon dark and the trees but shadows unable to see rosalind he believed the sun was dead sitting down under an oak at the edge of a wood he began to cry well well young fellow why are you sorrowing in this fashion asked an old woman woodpicker who just then came out of the wood her back bent beneath a faggot of dried sticks what good would it be to tell you said he you can do nothing for me my poor woman perhaps you are mistaken about that said the crone while speaking she straightened herself up and threw away her burden she was no longer a woodpicker but a fairy beautiful as the day dressed in a robe of silver lace and with her hair garlanded with precious stones as to the dead branches immediately she threw them away they took flight covering themselves with green leaves and returning to the trees from which they had fallen while the birds sang for joy to welcome the branches back oh my lady fairy cried the beggar lad falling on his knees take pity on my misfortune since i saw the princess at the window my heart no longer belongs to me and i feel that i shall never never love any one but her well said the fairy there is no great misfortune in that oh cried he could there be a greater for me do you understand that i shall die if i do not marry the princess well what is to hinder you from marrying her said the fairy she is not engaged i believe oh madame look at my rags see my bare feet i am but a poor fellow who begs upon the road that does not matter said the fairy nothing can hinder one from being loved who loves sincerely such is the sweet and eternal law of life the king and queen will repulse you with disdain and the courtiers will ridicule you but if your love for the princess is true she will be touched by it and will give you her pity the young fellow shook his head 
he could not believe that such a miracle was possible take care said the fairy or your want of fate will be punished in a way that will be anything but pleasant however as you are suffering i am willing to come to your aid make a wish and i will grant it i wish replied the youth promptly to be the most powerful prince on earth so that i may carry the princess whom i adore dear me dear me said the fairy why don't you go instead and sing a love song underneath her window and not trouble yourself with the cares which your wish will bring you but since i have promised it shall be as you desire let me however first warn you of one thing when you have ceased to be what you are now no enchanter no fairy not even myself will be able to restore you to your first condition once become a prince and you will remain a prince for ever do you think answered the youth that the royal husband of the princess rosalind will ever wish to be again a beggar upon the highway well i only hope you may be happy said the fairy with a sigh then with a golden wand she touched him upon the shoulder and in the twinkling of an eye the beggar became a magnificent lord glittering in silks and jewels riding upon an arabian courser at the head of a train of plumed courtiers and a throng of warriors in golden armour a prince of such magnificence could only be received at the king's court in one way he was welcomed with fuss and bustle and for a whole week there were feastings balls and fetes of every conceivable kind in his honour but it was not in these pleasures that the prince was occupied at every hour of the day and night he thought of rosalind when he saw her he felt his heart bound with joy when he heard her speak he thought he was listening to faultless music and he almost fainted with delight when she gave him her hand to dance a minuet but one thing worried him somewhat she whom he loved seemed to pay but little heed to all his attentions she remained silent and went about with a melancholy air at length he asked the royal parents for their daughter's hand in marriage and as may be supposed they took care not to refuse so splendid an offer so the beggar of a little while ago was going to possess the loveliest princess in the world and so extraordinary was his happiness on receiving the parents consent that he felt as though he could have danced the minuet by himself before all the court alas his joy was but short-lived no sooner was rosalind told of her parents wishes than she fell in a swoon in the arms of her ladies of honour and when she came to herself it was to say with tears and with wringing of hands that she did not wish to marry and that she would kill herself before she became the wife of the prince more in despair than can well be described the unhappy prince ran into the room to which the princess had been carried and fell on his knees before her cruel one he cried take back your words she slowly opened her eyes and replied weakly but firmly prince nothing can break down my resolution i shall never marry you what he cried have you the barbarity to wound a heart that is all yours what crime have i committed to deserve such a punishment do you doubt my love do you fear that i shall ever cease to worship you ah if you could read my inmost thoughts you would have neither those doubts nor fears he did not stop there but said everything which a great grief could inspire and said it so well that rosalind was moved to tenderness but not of the kind that he wished unhappy prince she said if my pity is any consolation to you i willingly accord it i am moreover the readier to sympathize with you because i feel just the same sort of pain and sorrow that you do what do you mean princess he asked in wonder i mean she replied that i refused you because i am hopelessly in love with a beggar lad who with bare feet and uncovered head passed one day before my father's castle who stood to look at me but who went away and has never come back again End of chapter 7chapter eight of the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun by Cotille menendez translated by thomas jarry vivian read by carla patton chapter eight a poor diet there was great distress at the court and throughout the kingdom because for four days the king's son had taken nothing to eat if he had had a fever or some other melee no one would have been surprised at this long fast but all the doctors agreed in saying that the prince was as well as possible except for the weakness caused by going so long without food but why should he thus deprive himself of food nothing else was talked of by the courtiers and even the common people who instead of saying good day to each other inquired has he eaten this morning no one however was as anxious as the king this was not because he felt any remarkable affection for his son for the young man had caused him a great deal of discontent although more than sixteen years old the prince showed the greatest dislike for both politics and arms when he assisted at the council of ministers he yarned during the finest speeches in a very impolite way and once when sent out at the head of an army to chastise a horde of rebels he had returned before evening with a sword garland with morning glories and his soldiers bearing handfuls of violets and honeysuckle given his reason that he had found a lovely wooded dell on the way and that it was much more amusing to pick flowers than to kill men he loved to walk along beneath the trees of the royal park and found it a pleasure to listen to the songs of the nightingales when the moon rose the few people whom he allowed to enter his apartments told the others that they had seen there books spread all over the carpet with instruments of music psalteries and mandolin and that at night he passed long hours gazing with moist eyes at the stars add to this that he was pale and slight as a young girl and that instead of wearing armor he clothed himself in garments of clear silk and you can understand why the king was out of countenance in having such a son but as the prince was the sole heir to the crown his health was of great consequence to the state and it was necessary that everything possible should be done to keep him from dying of hunger he was entreated he was supplicated to eat but only shook his head without reply cooks of splendid skill brought him the most tempting dishes the most appetizing fish the most savory meats the most delicate early vegetables salmon trout hunches of venison bear's paws heads of suckling wild boar hares pheasants frosts quail snipes all loaded the table at each meal then thinking him tired of ordinary meats and common vegetables they brought him filet of bison loins of chinese dog dressed in swallow's nests brichettes of hummingbirds slices of grilled monkey and young shoots of pinel cooked in antelope fat but the young prince made signs that he was not hungry and motioned the servants away with a slight gesture of weariness things had arrived at this pass and the king was almost in despair when the youth scarcely able to hold himself up and whiter than a lily spoke as follows father if you do not wish to see me die give me leave to quit your kingdom and to go wherever i think fit and without being accompanied by a single person why replied the king in your feeble state you would faint before taking the third step my son it is to recover my strength that i wish to leave here the prince replied have you ever read the story of taboo the rhymer who was made prisoner by the fairies it is not my custom to read anything said his father very haughtily i am a king and i don't read let me tell you then said the son 
that while with the fairies Tibu lived a happy happy life and that he was above all things delighted when the hours for meals came as the little pages who were really gnomes served him for soup a drop of dew upon an acacia leaf for rose a butterfly's wings brawled in the rays of the sunshine and for dessert a bee's kiss upon a petal of rose a pretty thin dinner said the king who could not resist smiling notwithstanding his cares it is the only one though replied the son that i wish for i can't eat the flesh of killed animals or vegetables nourished in mud the same as other fellows allow me please to go to the fairies and if they invite me to their repast i shall eat satisfy my hunger and then return full of health what would you have done had you been in the king's place what the king did was that seeing his only son already on the point of dying he thought it best to humour him and so let him go now the kingdom being near the forest of Brasilia, the youth had not far to go in order to reach the fairy's home they received him with right hearty welcome not however because he was the son of a powerful monarch but because he had found pleasure in listening to the nightingale's song when the moon rose and in leaning on the window sill watching the distant stars a fete was given in his honor in a vast hall having walls of rose marble lit up with diamonds while to please him the loveliest fairies danced the scarf dance in a circle this so charmed the young man that though he suffered the cruel pains of hunger he wished the dance might last for ever however he grew feebler and still more feeble and he felt that unless he took some nourishment he would soon die he confided his condition to one of the fairies and even dared to ask at what hour they supped why whenever you please said the fairy she at once gave an order when a little gnome brought the prince for his soup a drop of dew upon an acacia leaf what splendid soup said the prince and declared he had not imagined anything more delicious next for the roast another gnome brought him a butterfly's wing grilled in the sun and served on a thorn by way of a skewer this he ate with delight at a single swallow but what most charmed the prince was the dessert which was a trace of a bee's kiss upon a rose leaf well asked the fairy are you satisfied he nodded his head to answer yes but his head fell further forward and the poor prince died of weakness End of chapter chapter nine of the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun by cattell menendez translated by thomas jari vivan read by carla patton chapter nine the money box once upon a time there was a poor beggar girl named jocelyn she begged upon a road along which no one passed so that no elms ever fell into the small thin hand which grew tired from being held out so long now and then the leaves of some fading flower were strewn upon her from a branch shaken by the wind and occasionally too a swallow fluttering by on noiseless wings gave her a little chirp but these offerings the only ones she received were not of the sort which we need to buy things to eat and drink or for clothes to wear as jocelyn well knew to her sorrow her lot was indeed a hard one she was born 
she did not know where or when her first recollection being that of awakening one sunny morning under a bush by the roadside her life had never been like that of other young girls who each winter's evening returned to the cheerful cottage around which was the smell of a good meal being cooked who held up their foreheads at night for a kiss from father and mother and who then slept in a warm bed facing the fire which soon blinked and went to sleep also what jocelyn had to do each evening as soon as the dark came on was to clamber into some big elm or oak tree and sleep upon a branch near the squirrels who knew her so well that they leaped about her arms shoulders and head and played with their little paws in her tangled hair which was the color of gold and was so bright that it gleamed in the darkness of the branches like a light set down in a big room when the nights were chill she would willingly have curled herself up in some blackbird or finch's nest had she not been too big to get into it her dress was made of an old linen bag which she had chanced to find one day by the roadside each springtime she patched up this with green leaves and as she was pretty and sweet-looking with fresh and blooming cheeks you would have taken her for a roll set amid its leaves for food she contented herself with nuts from the woods and berries from the lanes although now and then she managed to indulge in a grand feast of grasshoppers toasted before a fire of dry grass you can see can't you that jocelyn was one of the poorest little girls it is possible to imagine and if her condition was cruel in the summer when there was warmth in the air and fruit upon the trees think what it must have been when the cold breeze whistled about the dry nut trees and chilled her skin through the thin covering of dead leaves one day just as she had returned from picking a mess of berries she saw a fairy dressed in tissue of gold coming out of a flowering thicket jocelyn said the fairy in a sweet and musical voice because your heart is as good as your face is charming i am going to make you a present you see this little money box of the color and shape of an opening pink it is yours don't fail to put into it everything that you have or that you ever get that is most precious and when you break it it will give back to you one hundredfold what it has received thereupon the fairy vanished like a flame blown out by a gust of wind and jocelyn who had indulged in a momentary hope of relief on seeing the fairy felt sadder than ever that could not have been a good fairy she said for what could be more cruel than to give a money box to a poor girl who has neither a cent nor a stitch to her name what can i put in it if i have nothing to call my own at first she was tempted to smash the present among the rocks but she thought better of this and then feeling very sad she began to cry her tears falling one by one into the poor little money box which now looked like a full-blown pink and which was no bigger another day she experienced a pleasure which after it had passed left her still more unhappy than ever along this road on which no one had heretofore passed there happened to come the king's son on his return from a hunt mounted on a horse which shook its snow-white mane at each step with a falcon on his wrist clad in blue satin shot with silver and with a proud and sunny face the prince looked so beautiful that the poor beggar girl thought he must surely be an angel in the dress of a nobleman with starry eyes and open mouth she stretched out her arms towards him and as she did so she felt something which seemed to be her heart going out of her and following him 
alas he passed by without even having seen her alone as before more so indeed from having one brief instant ceased to be so she dropped helplessly into the ditch by which she had stood closing her eyes tightly so that nothing should replace the charming vision she had just seen when she opened them all wet with tears she saw beside her the poor little money-box seizing it as the only companion of her misery she kissed it with fervor but the fairy's present was no more moved by this gentle sad caress than a stone would be if brushed by a rose from this day on jocelyn experienced such grief that nothing she had hitherto endured could be compared with it she recalled as though they had been happy hours those times when she had only suffered from hunger and cold to go to sleep in the chilling wind was nothing to this now she knew what real sorrow was she thought of other girls of the fine ladies at the court less pretty than you said the mirror of the stream each hour she could see the handsome prince with his bright face she pictured him approaching these fine ladies walking with one smiling with that and then as being married to some glorious young princess come from tresbion in a litter carried by a white elephant with a gilded trunk she however the poor beggar girl of the deserted road she would continue to live in the same loneliness in the same misery far away from him whom she loved so tenderly and she would never 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 see him again still there was no anger in her grief and her bitterest pain was to think that possibly the king's son would not be as tenderly loved by the princes of tresbion as he was by her at last one bitter snowy day she resolved to end her suffering she felt that she could no longer endure all her misery and decided to throw herself into the lake which stood in the middle of the forest so accustomed she was to the icy air that she was sure she would not feel the coldness of the water shivering she started for the lake as fast as she could it was one of those gray mornings when the air was thick with snowflakes and when the sky is covered by lead-colored clouds amidst all the sad surrounding of the whitening earth the bare trees and the mournful looking hills in the distance nothing seemed bright except her golden hair and one would have said that even on this dull morning a little glimpse of sunshine rested there she walked quicker and quicker but when she reached the edge of the lake her rags were covered with snow so that she looked as though adorned in a white robe of a bride good-bye she cried her last thought being of the prince just however as she was about to throw herself into the water the same fairy clad in a long golden veil came out from the branches of a thicket jocelyn asked the fairy what are you going to do i'm going to drown myself she replied and why do you wish to die asked the spirit you know well enough wicked fairy answered the poor girl that i am unhappy the most wretched death would be sweeter to me than life but the fairy only laughed a pleasant little laugh before drowning yourself she said you ought to at least to break that money box of what use would it be said jocelyn since being so poor as i am i have had nothing to put in it well break it just the same said the fairy jocelyn hardly dared to disobey and then having drawn 
the useless little present from underneath her rags she broke it against the stone immediately the wintry forest turned into a magnificent palace of marble with a blue roof studded with gold stars while the handsome prince appeared from the fragments of the money box took the beggar girl in his arms and kissed her right royally then while jocelyn wept with joy he asked her if she would be his bride so that the good little money box did indeed give back a hundredfold for it changed her sorrowful kiss into the prince's caress and it turned her tears of sadness into those of joy End of chapter chapter ten of the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun by cachul mendes translated by thomas jean re vivian eighteen fifty five to nineteen twenty five a wonderful attraction when the princess athilde was born people were struck with admiration and astonishment with admiration because she was the sweetest little darling that you could ever dream of with astonishment because she was scarcely any larger than a full-blown rose or longer than your finger lying in a cradle no bigger than your hand you would have said she was a little featherless bird in its nest the king and queen were never tired of admiring the baby's tiny limbs her pink feet which you might have put into a doll's stocking her little body like a white mouse or her face which you might have covered with a daisy to be sure they were somewhat troubled to see her so very 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 small and wouldn't believe that their little daughter was a dwarf what they hoped was that she would grow and grow without losing her cunningness they were very much deceived in their expectations, however. She remained cunning and sweet as ever, but she grew so very little that when she was five years old she was scarcely higher than a good-sized blade of grass, and in playing in the garden paths she was obliged to stand on tiptoe to pluck the violets. Famous doctors were brought to the palace, and were promised the richest rewards if they succeeded in even adding a few inches to the height of the princess. They consulted together with gravity, crossing their hands over their stomachs and shutting their eyes behind their spectacles. They invented medicines which a field was obliged to drink, and unfailing ointments with which she was to be rubbed every morning and evening. All was labour lost. The princess remained a charming dwarf, so small that when she was playing with a favourite lapdog, she could pass between its paws without having to bend her head. The king and queen then sought the fairies, with whom they had always been in excellent terms. They came at once, summoned litters of golden cloth with fringes of precious stones, carried by naked Africans, others in crystal cars drawn by four unicorns. Some who found it more convenient to come in by the window or the chimney appeared as birds of paradise or blue-winged jays, but who, directly they lighted on the floor of the drawing-room, turned into lovely ladies all clothed in satin. One after the other, they touched the field with their wands, took her in their hands, she was no heavier than a lark, kissed her, breathed on her hair, and made signs on her forehead, while they murmured strange words. But the charms of the fairies had no more effect than the medicines of the doctors, and at sixteen the princess was so small that one morning she was caught in a trap that had been set in the park for nightingales. The courtiers did their best to console the royal parents. They declared that nothing was more ridiculous than a large figure, that to be tall was simply to be deformed, and that, as for them, they wished they were only six inches high. The ladies of honour gave up their high heels, and the chamberlains never came near the throne except on their knees but the ingenious flatterers didn't always succeed in consoling the king and queen and many times the parents could scarcely keep from crying as they kissed their little daughter with the tips of their lips for fear of swallowing her but they kept back their tears so that she mightn't be drowned in them 
as for othild she didn't appear at all put out by her misfortune and indeed seemed to take great pleasure in admiring her pretty little person in a hand mirror cut from a single diamond as time went on however the king and queen grew less sad and there was not much doubt that the time would have arrived when they would not have grieved at all over their daughter's misfortune if something hadn't occurred to renew their sorrow the report of the princess othil's beauty reached the young emperor of Siranagan, and he thereupon set ambassadors asking her in marriage you may easily understand the trouble which was caused by this proposal what marry this little doll no bigger than a paroquet why it was not to be thought of then too the demand of the emperor of Siranagan was all the more dreadful because he was of enormous figure he was not only the handsomest of princes he was also the biggest giant of the whole countryside on the day of his birth it had been impossible to find a cradle big enough for the enormous baby prince and he was put to bed on the thick carpets of the throne room at three years of age he had to stoop to steal the birds nests from the top branches of the oak trees his parents like those of Athild, had vainly consulted the doctors and fairies he had grown and grown after a fashion that was out of all reason and when his subjects in celebrating his first victory had put up arches of triumph over the streets the prince was obliged to get off his horse to pass under them and even then he struck the silver dragon on his helmet and nearly knocked it off naturally the king and queen informed the ambassadors that such a marriage was impossible but when the young emperor heard this reply he was furious the story of Othil's littleness he declared to be an absurd story, and he clapped on his helmet with its shining silver wings, crying out that he would sweep the kingdom with fire and blood to avenge such a trick. The young emperor kept his word. There were terrible battles, towns were destroyed, and their entire population put to the edge of the sword, so that at last the king and queen came to the conclusion that nothing would be left of their kingdom unless they came to terms with the gigantic conqueror who was marching towards the capital leaving behind him a train of cities wrecked and forests in flame they therefore sent to him asking for peace and promising the hand of their daughter in marriage they did this the more readily because they were confident that the emperor would give up his idea as soon as he saw othild and march back to his own country with his victorious army the day was then set for the first interview which was held in the park the emperor not being able to stand up in any of the halls of the palace well said the emperor i don't see the princess will she soon come look down at your feet said the king there she was indeed scarcely higher than the borders of the garden walk so slender and so pretty in her little golden robe with glistening stones about her forehead and looking so much the smaller beside the young and magnificent emperor alas said he for he was grieved indeed to see her down there so charming but so small alas said she in her turn for she was grieved indeed to see him up there so beautiful but so big tears came into the eyes of both into hers as she looked up and into his as he looked down sire then said the king you see that you cannot possibly marry my daughter i am grieved i am sure to have to give up the honour he didn't finish his sentence and mute with astonishment he stood staring at the princess and the emperor as he looked she began to grow and the young emperor to shrink for love more powerful than the fairies drew them one to the other soon they were nearly of the same height and then their lips touched like two roses on the same stem end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gerges. The Fairy Spinning Wheel and the Tales It Spun by Catul Mendez, translated by Thomas Yandre Vivienne, eighteen fifty-five to nineteen twenty-five. Chapter Eleven: The Lame Angel one summer's morning the son of the king of the pale islands was walking in the snow for in that country it snows even in high summer 
the flakes coming down in full view of a warm sun and turning as they fall into jasmine blossoms and lilies while thus walking the prince saw on the ground before him something glittering like pure silver and trembling gently like a harp string just touched by the fingers of a musician if it had been smaller this glittering trembling thing might have been a dove's wing covered with pearls of dew but being as large as it was and with the tips of its feathers still tinged with the lovely blue it had doubtless gained in sweeping through the skies it could be nothing else than an angel's wing on seeing it the prince became very sad here he thought is a pinion that has been wrenched from some divine messenger perhaps it has been lost in a battle with some dark spirit perhaps it has been blown off in some gust from the underworld or perhaps it has been cut from him as a punishment for some crime committed against the rulers of heaven whatever may have been the case there is no doubt the poor angel must be in great trouble over his loss no longer could he fly with the rest of his brothers being now unbalanced and lame for surely the prince went on thinking he must be lame since angels are not bodily creatures but are simply souls with wings and therefore could not be lame of foot but must be lame of wing in thinking of this probable grief of the unfortunate angel the prince of the pale islands felt his compassion much moved and he resolved to give back the wing of the angel who had lost it but this was a plan more easily formed than carried out the chief difficulty was how to find the suffering angels paradise is not a place where one can come and go as one might wish nor would it do to placard the city walls and all the kingdom announcing that if any cherub or seraph had lost the precious object he might recover the same by applying at the palace of the king for angels are not in the habit of walking up and down the streets like human loungers thinking of these and of many other things the young prince was sore perplexed and he decided that the best thing he could do was to consult with a little sweetheart of his who lived in the forest tucking the wing under his arm he forthwith went to see her and as chance would have it he met her at the very border of the wood apparently walking to meet him ah little one said he i bring you sad news what is it she asked anxiously see he said what i have found an angel has lost one of his white wings she blushed but did not seem surprised you would have almost have said in fact that she was already aware of the unfortunate accident and when he added i have resolved to give it back to him she lowered her eyes and blushed the deeper now then sweetheart said he you are the only one i know of who can tell me just how to manage this you are so pretty and so innocent that the celestial spirits meet each day in your thoughts and lodge each night in your dreams it seems to me impossible that while listening to them both day and night as you surely must you have not heard them speak of what has happened to one of them alas said she i already know as much of the accent as i possibly can for it is none other than my guardian angel who has thus lost one of his wings what cried the prince your guardian angel what a singular coincidence but tell me please how this unfortunate loss came about it was by your fault i assure you said the little maiden do you remember that walk we took the other evening under the orange trees that evening i mean when we thought that the stars looked like golden fruit remember it cried the prince how do you think i can ever forget it it was on that evening that you allowed me for the first time to kiss you since when by the way my mouth has been perfumed as though i had eaten roses yes she replied it was on that evening you kissed me but while to me and to you that kiss might have been sweet it was cruel to the angel who followed me among the orange branches at that moment that you kissed me one of his wings fell from him and why asked the prince in amazement because answered his sweetheart the law among the guardian angels is that they must be the first to suffer for any errors or mistakes or indiscretions committed by those over whom it is their duty to watch what an unjust law said the prince and how your poor maimed angel must have suffered more than you can imagine she replied ashamed and hurt unable to return to the skies even if he dared to he does nothing but weep and sigh as for me i can scarcely sleep at night however greatly i might wish to dream of you so much do his lamentations keep me from closing my eyes very well then exclaimed the prince nothing remains but for us to give him back his wing i do not see how i can repent for what i have done but i would willingly find out any way by which the fault might be repaired i think there is one such way said she let me know it at once then he cried what we must do she said and she spoke so low that he could scarcely hear her 
what we must do is to restore things to the exact condition in which they were before we took the walk under the orange trees my guardian angel lost his wing because i received your kiss he would regain his wing no doubt if if what exclaimed the prince if she whispered if i gave the kiss back to you and so she did and as she did so there was a movement in the branches behind them it was the angel who flew upward joyfully flapping his wings only those two wings which had been white were now rose-colored end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phone the fairy spinning wheel and the tales it spun by cachil mendez translated by thomas john Vivian, eighteen fifty five to nineteen twenty five the two daisies lambert and landry resolved to start out into the world to seek their fortunes they were in fact obliged to their parents being very poor people and quite unable to offer them any promise of better days so early one spring morning the two youths set out on their way landry was but fifteen years old while lambert had just turned sixteen they were therefore very young to thus throw themselves on fate's unsteady care and while they had much hope they also felt some little anxiety as to the future but as it happened they were strangely comforted by an adventure which came about almost at the beginning of their journey it was in this wise as they passed by the edge of a little wood who should come out to meet them but a lady a lady decked with flowers from top to toe golden cups and pimpernels were in her hair her gown was trimmed with convolvulus blossoms and fell down to two tiny slippers of moss which looked like green velvet while her eyes were like two blue cornflowers it was the fairy springtime whom you may sometimes see and hear about april tripping and singing across the flowering meadows and through the budding woods stopping the youths she said i have been watching you and as you are about to start out on a long journey i'm going to make each of you a present here landry take this daisy and to you lambert i give a daisy also all you will need at any time is to pluck one of the petals of these flowers and throw the leaf from you in order to secure that which you most ardently wish for now go and try to make good use of springtime's presents the youths thanked the fairy with all the politeness at their command and then with light hearts set out on their way once more but scarcely had they arrived at the crossroads than a disagreement sprang up between them lambert wished to turn to the right landry to the left when to settle the dispute they decided that each should go as he pleased and so separated with an affectionate shake of the hands perhaps after all each brother was not particularly disappointed at being alone in order that he might the more freely dispose of the present made him by the flower-clad fairy on entering the first village he came to landry saw a young girl leaning from a window at sight of whom he started with pleasure never had he seen so lovely a creature never in fact had he dreamed that any such existed still little more than a child with hair so fine and so blonde that one could scarce distinguish it from the sunny air about her her face was delicately pink and white a lily as to the forehead and a rose to the cheeks her eyes were like a bed of violets in which a few raindrops lingered and you had only to look at her mouth to wish that you were a bee landry did not hesitate long he tore off and threw away the first of the daisy's petals and the wind had scarcely taken up the frail leaf before the girl had smiled at him from the window and the next instant had run down and placed her hand in his landry soon grew tired of his pretty playmate but each leaf brought him another indeed his only aim in life was to find a way of tasting all of its pleasures whatever he saw he longed for 
and whatever he longed for he had each day each hour in fact the daisy lost one of its petals and the breeze could scarcely find time to stir the branches of the rose trees so much was it occupied in wafting about the leaves of the fairy's gift brother lambert adopted an entirely different plan he was a saving young man one for whom it would be impossible to waste a treasure as soon as he found himself alone on the road he decided to carefully treasure the fairy's gift for so he reasoned with himself no matter how numerous the daisy's leaves then might be if he were to tear one off for every whim and wish the day would soon come in which there would be no more leaves to pluck he decided therefore to prudently reserve the wonderful flower until some future time so when he reached the next town he bought a little box very solid and fastening with a well-made block in this box he placed the daisy resolving never to look at it so that it might be out of temptation's way sensible methodical and troubling himself only about serious matters lambert became a merchant and soon amassed large sums of money he had nothing but contempt for those neglectful people who passed their time in feastings and frolics caring nothing for the morrow nor did he ever fail to preach good round sermons to such triflers whenever the opportunity offered so it came about that he was looked up to by all honest folk and that his life was spoken of as an example for all to follow he continued to grow respected and rich working from early morn till late at night and each day rolling up his wealth but truth to tell he was not so happy as he had hoped to be he could not help thinking of those pleasures which he so persistently denied himself yet he had but to open the little box and throw a petal to the wind to have as many pleasures as his brother had enjoyed but he steadfastly turned away from such dangerous thoughts and decided to wait there was plenty of time he said he would enjoy himself when he was older and more settled the breeze while whisking by him whispered come throw me a leaf throw me just one so that i may bring you at least one pleasureful day and that i may see you smile for once but he turned a deaf ear to the entreaty and the breeze went off to stir the branches of the rose trees now after many years had passed it happened one day that lambert while visiting one of his country properties chanced to meet a ragged man making his way across the clover field well well exclaimed he throwing up his hands are you not my brother landry i am certainly he replied the other why what a wretched state you are in said lambert i am sadly afraid that you have made but poor use of the fairy springtime's gift well said landry i did perhaps throw away the petals too quickly still though i am now but badly off i do not repent of my youthful thoughtlessness ah brother lambert i may have been wasteful but i was very happy as long as the flower lasted pooh pooh said lambert there is little comfort in that fact for your present condition now just look at me here i am rich and prosperous yet i have but to make a single move to enjoy all the pleasures which you have wasted is that possible said landry it is replied his rich brother because i have kept the fairy's present intact aha he went on i can still have all the good times that i wish when i wish so much for being economical come he added and i will show you my untouched flower they soon reached the place where lambert kept his treasure and selecting a small key from a big bunch he opened the tiny box there he exclaimed with an air of triumph see how i have kept my flower but he suddenly turned pale and staggered back for instead of the fresh blooming daisy which he had locked away so many years ago there was now nothing before his eyes but the little heap of grey dust like a pinch of ashes ah cursed fairy he cried you have played me a wretched trick indeed as he said this the fairy springtime herself stood before them i have played you no trick she said 
neither you nor your brother those two daisies were not real flowers they were your youth your youth landry which you passed in the pursuit of caprice and pleasure your youth lambert which you have allowed to wither and fade without ever having enjoyed or valued it at all landry it is true wasted his youth by recklessly plucking off and throwing away its many chances but you lambert have not even the remembrance of having had any youth at all end of the two daisies recording by phone